So yeah, so I'm going to talk today, I mean, as you've heard my background, is a radionuclide therapy. I'm going to concentrate on PSMA today, and um, I was told I need some learning objectives. This is, what I'm, this is what I'm going to do. So I'm sure that many of you are not that familiar with the principles of radionuclide therapy. You may have seen some work with Zevalin, so I'm going to talk a bit about those general principles. And now we're going to, the main focus of the talk will be on some prospective data using a beta labeled PSMA molecule, and then talk a little bit, I'm going to show you, if I've got time, hopefully show you a few cases at the end, how we um, select patients. So I think it's interesting, if you look at uh, this era of targeted therapies, of course, radiotherapy has always been a targeted therapy, and what you see in these pictures here is the evolution of external beam techniques going from conformal radiotherapy through to IMRT and VMAS, and the objective of these is to improve the therapeutic ratio because the goal is to get radiation to the tumor cells and avoid giving radiation to surrounding tissues. I mean, that's what limits radio curability with any radiation treatment. Now, it's been a dream of oncologists uh, for many years that you know that you can you could inject an agent and it will be carried. I mean, this is, this is a very old picture. This is actually not specifically referring to cancer, but the principle is the same that small molecules you can inject and these molecules look like, to me, they look like antibodies. And that's where I started off in this field. And the idea that you can specifically target radiation biologically, and that's what's always that's what's fascinated me for years. And so this, I suppose, is the prototype. I mean, there are no, there are virtually, well, there's probably no solid tumors with established metastatic disease that can be cured with systemic chemotherapy. But here we have an example from, you know, the 1940s. We know that metastatic papillary thyroid cancer can be cured by radiation and not just kicked down the road. I mean, cured. And, um, and this works because of the high tumor to background ratio. Radioiodine is sucked in by, by, the, by the tumor cells and concentrated there. So we can cure this. So this is a prototype, and this is what I think people have been dreaming about in radionuclides for a long time. So um, the unit that I work in has got a very strong history in neuroendocrine tumors, and these have sort of led the way, really. I mean, the NETA study published a few years ago, this, people finally realized that radiolabeled peptides are a highly effective treatment. And then red nuclear medicine physicians have known that radiolabeled somatostatin analogs are the most effective treatment for neuroendocrine tumors for years, but they've never done the prospective studies to convince the wider community. And with the advance of NETA, uh, or the uh, publishing of NETA, all of a sudden people have woken up to peptides. So uh, I won't dwell on this data, but it's, um, this brings me nicely on to PSMA, another, well, it's not technically a peptide, but a peptide-like molecule. And all of a sudden we've got in the last two or three years, we've got two very, very successful peptide label treatments that have arrived. So, going back to what I was saying about therapeutic ratio and targeting, PSMA is perhaps an ideal target for radionuclide therapy. It's highly expressed on the tumor cells and minimally expressed on normal tissues. And what's interesting also when you're trying to deliver a therapeutic agent is that following ligand binding by either, by either small molecules or peptides, the the ligand is internalized within the cells, as you can see in this picture here. So if you're trying to deliver something, it's nice if it doesn't just stick on the surface because it might fall off, so it's actually internalized. And, and this is a particular benefit when you're using radiometals, you know, metal-based radionuclides. There's, uh, and then this is why mercury poisoning is such a problem. Once you get metal into cells, it doesn't come out, residualization. So once your isotope is in the cells, it tends to stay there. So. With PSMA, I mean, some radionuclide therapies directly targeting bone, you know, radium and strontium, smear, these agents will directly target the bone. With PSMA targeting therapy, there are two uh, components to this. There's a targeting agent, I call it the taxi, that just delivers the payload, which gives specificity. And then there's, of course, the payload. And uh, I'm going to concentrate on radiation, but people are using PSMA molecules to deliver chemotherapy as well. Uh, and there are multiple choices in the, the radionuclide that you can put Onto your into your taxi, and I'll talk. I'll talk mainly about beef beaters, but I will, if I've got time, touch on um, research of the other agents. Now, PSMA has been targeted for a while. Uh, some of you may remember prostacint, uh, which uh, targeted this uh, this um, I get this pointer to work. Targeted this intracellular epitope, which is down here, uh, and wasn't very effective. You know, the cells needed to be dead for the molecule to access the uh, the site. Uh, more recent work is uh, concentrated on this agent uh, J591, which is a monoclonal antibody, and that targets the extracellular structure of PSMA. What I'm mainly going to talk to about today is the small molecule inhibitors. Uh, 
Uh, PSMA is an enzymatic function and, and, and is involved in folate metabolism. And so these molecules target the enzymatic site. Now it's interesting if you look at if you look at the uh, the properties of these two delivery vehicles, because the antibodies are huge molecules. You know, 150 kilodaltons. I um, mean, I've often drawn this. I don't know if any of you have been to Melbourne. There's all these tiny little laneways with all these cafes. And to me, uh, an antibody is like trying to deliver your pizza using an articulated lorry and driving it through the streets of this thing. It just they take a long time to get into the tumor. And also, they take a long time to clear, clear from the circulation. So you inject these, these monoclonal antibodies, and they float around for two weeks. And all the time, if you label them on a beta, they're radiating the marrow. So all it, uh, there's been lots of work published on J591, and, and you do see responses. You see very lots of dose-limiting marrow toxicity. Whereas these peptides, these peptides are tiny. It's like the little scooter going through, you know, it's like, you know, those you know, little Uber, Uber scooters going through the laneways. So they're much more agile, they get into the tumours quickly, and they also clear very quickly from the circulation. They go out through the kidneys, and within an hour, virtually all the radioactivity is gone. And this is illustrated, I, I hope you'll see this in, this in this diagram here. On the left-hand side, you can see an image of Immunopet using the J591 molecule labelled for zirconium, uh, zirconium-89, which is a long-acting PET agent. And on the right, you have uh, PSMA imaging using a PSMA-11, uh, labeled with gallium. And what you can see from the picture on the left is, you know, the black shows where the radiation is, and you can see it's in the circulation for a, a very long time. And by around day eight, it started to localize to the tumor. Uh, whereas if you look at the PSMA image on the right, you see that, you know, within 40 minutes, it's in the tumor. There are some other differences here, though. If you look at the salivary gland uptake, the antibodies seem to, they, they, they don't seem to get into the salivary tissues as, as well. This may be an advantage to them. So these, just to give you an idea of the size, these are a couple of the molecules that you can see here. PSMA11 is the agent that we use for, um, for PET imaging, which is how we select patients for this treatment. And the other two molecules, 617 and INT, are the two most developed molecules. So these are first, though these are first generation molecules. I mean, these are being optimized, and I suspect these molecules will improve. I mean, the antibodies uh, are also being optimized too, and uh, these are just an example of antibody fragments the smallest uh, antibody fragment is a single chain FV. And it is possible that a single chain FV to, uh, to PSMA may offer a balance between being small enough to get some of the advantages and may not, may not be taken up into salivary tissues. There's lots of work, though I haven't seen any clinical data with these agents yet. So anyway, so that's a delivery vehicle. So we've got, a, we've got an excellent target now, which is PSMA. We have excellent delivery vehicles, you know, um, with, the, with the small molecules. We've got, we've got the taxi, now we just need to look at, the, look at the, the cargo. Now most of the work is concentrated on beta emitters um, and um, just, so I was just interested to look at their characteristics. So if you look at the, if you look at the, at the, the column on the right, these are sparsely ionizing radiation. In other words, you know, um, if you imagine a track coming off, you know, a, a you know, a track of radiation coming off the isotope, it would, it would, it's just intermittent. So you need, you were looking for double strand breaks with DNA because that you can repair single strand breaks very easily. So you need enough hits with a beta to, to cause double strand breaks. So you need quite a bit of radiation to see cell kill with beta emissions, but you know, we can reach adequate levels with what we're doing now. They have a range of a few millimeters in tissue, which means they do surround, they, you don't need to target every cell, but there is collateral damage to other cells when they're traveling around, which is why you see the problem with the bone marrow. So um, you also look, need to look at the character, when you're designing a study, you also need to look at the characteristic, there's particular characteristics of these agents. And one thing to look at is a half-life, you know, because you, this, the, you, the half-life needs to tarry up with the, with the half-life of your delivery vehicle. You know, you have, I've seen studies where people have taken isotopes with a half-life of half an hour and put them onto antibodies, which take four hours to get into the tumor. It's never going to work. So, um, I mean, most of the work that we're doing now is with lutetium, which you can see on the bottom of the table here. And uh, it's got a range of a few millimeters in tissue. Now, that's important because we know, again, from neuroendocrine tumors, if, if these small peptides are going out through the kidneys, if you put the longer range isotopes, you know, yttrium-90 has got a range of 12 millimeters in tissue, even though they're only passing through the kidneys very quickly, you can see late toxicity. Whereas we know from the neuroendocrine tumors, if you use 
shorter range isotopes, even though the peptides go through the kidneys, they don't irradiate as much of the kidneys and we don't see the renal toxicity. So that's a major breakthrough and was a major downside, perceived as a major downside of peptides, which has now been resolved. So, so beta, beta particles where most of the work started with PSMA molecules. Now I sat down with a nuclear medicine colleague of mine about two or three years ago, just after this paper was published. And my background is antibodies. I know how the antibodies perform. And we looked at this study. It's just a single administration of a small molecule. This is, this is MIP1095. I told you the multitude of peptides out there. And the results are fantastic. The results are fantastic. If you look at, if you look at the PSA responses that were reported just from a single administration of this agent, you know, and this is, these are patients treated in Germany in compassionate access programs who failed everything else. And to see PSA response rates like this with minimal toxicity, this is non-randomized data, I just looked at this and said, well, we, we need a proper study to look at this. So um, during that, around that time frame, lots of little non-randomized studies have come out of Germany. And they all show the same things. They're giving, what's re remarkable is that they're giving different activities of radiation, different numbers of courses of treatment, but they all show the same things, very high response rates, minimal toxicity. But none of this data is prospective. And the oncology community as a whole is, you know, as with NETA, you can have a treatment that works if you don't have prospective data, nobody believes it. So we, we thought, well, we need a proper study to look at this. Um, and actually, I felt pretty convinced, we both felt pretty convinced that this treatment is going to be highly effective, but we wanted to bring it to the attention of the wider community. So we planned this study uh, with no funding uh, by co-investor, co-investigator Michael Hoffman is very well connected. And um, we had free lutetium for the study, which was it's about $4,000 a patient, and, and the peptide's really cheap. I mean, now the other point is, you see these monoclonal antibodies, they're expensive and they're complicated. These peptides, and a first-year chemistry student could make them, you know, it's, it, it should be just like, you know, $20, $30 for, for one of these, for one of these uh, molecules. Anyway, so we, we designed this prospective study, just 30 patients, so we did expand the cohort to 50. And uh, really we're looking at toxicity, but we did a few other things along the way. We looked at dose symmetry, really just trying to properly characterize what the response to these treatments were. So we proposed that this small molecule would eff effectively deliver radiation to the tumors, that it would be safe. Um, and um, anyway, so th these were the goals of the study. We gave up to four cycles of treatment within this study. Though, you'll, as you see, not everybody got four cycles, either because they didn't respond, or in a significant minority of patients, because the disease had just all gone. You know, by the time we'd given two or three cycles, there was nothing left to see. And I'll, when I come to the clinical cases at the end, I'll show you how we select patients to continue uh, treatment. So I think I've covered on these, these endpoints already. So in terms of selecting patients, this is a theranostic approach. The idea is that if you can image the tumor with a PSMA, um, you know, a gallium PSMA scan, you know that the molecules you deliver are going to be taken to your disease. So, um, you know, I mean, these are end-stage patients, and um, so, I mean, these criteria are what you'd expect, really. But um, the major screening uh, objective was to demonstrate high PSMA expression uh, on their staging scans. And also, also, we did FDG PET scans at the same time. Because in this group of patients, you following multiple cycles of therapy, there is de-differentiation. And you, you do find uh, in end-stage patients that they have widespread disease that's FDG avid, and you can't necessarily target all of it with your PSMA. So here's an example. So on the left-hand side is the uh, PSMA PET scan. On the right side is the FDG PET scan. And when you, when, you, when you look more closely at the images, on the left you can see the PSMA expression in the pelvis on the left-hand side. Look at the FDG scan on the right, you can see that if you gave PSMA, you know that you're not going to treat all of this disease, you're going to treat a small proportion of this disease. So these patients, although you might, I mean, maybe you would see a response, it's going to be very transient. So we've excluded these patients, you know, because we said, you know, we push them towards other therapies if there were other therapies available. You know, it's a principle in radiation, if you're giving a treatment, you want to be able to treat all the disease. I mean, you guys wouldn't take disease out if you thought you are going to leave half of it behind. And the same principle applies to us uh, for radiation. If we can't treat all of it, then, then we wouldn't take them on. So we screened 43 patients for this study, and as you can see, they were excluded about seven or eight of those were, were uh, excluded because either they didn't have enough PSMA expression, um, and I haven't shown you the imaging data, but the, you know, the, uh, the SUV of the PET images does seem to correlate with the radiation dose that we actually deliver to the tumour. 
Um, and then there are people that were excluded for other regions. I mean, these are sick, these patients there. Post Abbey, post Enza, post two lines of chemotherapy. Some of them were cytopenic performance stages. So we excluded some of these patients. Anyway, so we treated, we treated 30 patients. And it's interesting to, to remember, I, I, I told you about how not all of them got four patients. It's interesting to look and see there are six what I call exceptional responders in this group of patients. And I'll show you some pictures of how they did a little bit later on. So as I said, these patients were, they were sick. They'd had lots of treatments. You can see virtually all of them had received chemotherapy, second line antiandrogens. PSA doubling time in this group going into the study was about two and a half months. You know, we all know, we all know that patients got a PSA doubling time that quickly. They don't live very long. And uh, so, um, but they were, recent, they were reasonably fit. Lots of them were in pain and um, anyway, and, and large volume disease. I'll show you a few pictures so you can see lots of skeletal disease, not so much visceral disease actually in this group, but a lot of nodal disease. So looking at the primary endpoints, it was mainly a toxicity study. And what you can see here, I draw your attention to um, those side effects which we've attributed to treatment because there was, there was uh, morbidity in these patients that was pre-existing before they came onto the study. And if you look at the grade three and four toxicity, we didn't see a lot of toxicity. I mean, lymphopenia is well, of no clinical relevance, really, but we see that with all radionuclides because lymphocytes whisper, shout lymphocytes at the other side of the room. There's a lymphocyte there. It just pops. I mean, they're, they're so radiosensitive. So this isn't unexpected. If you look at the anemia and thrombocytopenia and look at the rates compared to the antibodies, we're talking you know, 10% or less. And virtually all of those patients that we saw cytopenias in came onto the study with, a, with some cytopenias at baseline. The other grade 1 to 2 toxicities were largely dry mouth, which was you know, there's some uptake there. Though actually that was tended to reverse. Most patients, it was there for a month or two after treatment and then it resolved. There's some nausea and vomiting, which we realized we could solve by giving them pre-medication with steroids, dexamethasone, so we solved that problem. And fatigue actually was, uh, transient fatigue was one of the major issues, but again, this was just like a week or so around the treatment, so very well, very well tolerated. If, and, uh, and if you look at the PSA response rates, well, we, you know, we, we confirmed really what the, what the other groups have seen. And these are, I mean, they're quite phenomenal really in this group of patients. And actually, we, 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 we just presented a poster of our data for the 50, N equals 50 cohort. And actually, our PSA response rate greater than 50% is, is about 63 or 64% in these guys. It's incredible, you know, these guys that have failed everything else. I mean, look at the 80% PSA response rate. That's 40% of patients have an 80% fall in their PSA. So in terms of... Uh, so. Um, uh, in terms of looking at imaging responses, I mean, bones are always difficult to assess, but if you look at soft tissue, you know, you've got more than 80% response rate in soft tissue lesions. Bone, you know, nodes, nodes disappearing, visceral disease disappearing. I'll show you some pictures of that later on. Um, but interestingly, the bone seems to be a sanctuary site to this treatment. If you look at the patients that progressed, um, a significant minority of them progressed. You know, normally these, these men are dying from skeletal events or, you know, obstruction or whatever, were we controlling that? And actually what we found is that a very common terminal event with them was development of a leukoerythroblastic pitcher where all the counts <coughs> fell. And we were initially concerned that this was myelodysplasia because we're giving radiation to the marrow. So we, we did marrow biopsies in these guys and it was full of tumour. So we think the marrow is a sanctuary site. You know, we're keeping people alive for another 12, 18 months and you know, the lowest, the lowest you know, the rung where the prostate cancer goes left is bone, which is perhaps not surprising. In terms of the quality of life, I don't want to dissect this table, but I mean, I mean you, can, you can go and see the paper you want to dissect through this, but, but basically we found about 40% of men had an improvement in their global quality of life after the first treatment. They just feel better. The guys hobble in with pain, and the pain across all time points when we did the quality of life uh, assessments improved, and the men just felt better. You know, I've given them lots of experimental treatments. These guys just come and you look forward to them coming back because so many of them feel better. Their pain is gone. They stop their painkillers and you know, they're eating again. And um, you know, a significant number of these men felt better with the treatment. So it's not just the numbers and the imaging. So if you look at the uh, survival, this is, just a, this is a secondary endpoint really in this group of patients, but a progression-free survival of around six months uh, is very respectable for this. And you know, if you look at patients going on to, you know, the second line chemotherapy with cabazitaxel in the tropic study, where they didn't really feel better with the treatment, they're certainly equivalent to those. 
And our overall survival in this group, which we, we, our cutoff was around 25 months, was 13 months. So I haven't, I haven't shown you the data. Actually, there are, there's another slide where you look at the patients that had a good PSA response, you know, more than 50% response, and the median survival is 17 months. And I've got two or three patients that are more than two years out now uh, who are still well and with no, no sign of active disease when they're not cured. But, you know, I mean, that's quite impressive in this group of patients. So this is, I'll just show you this, this is, uh, this just gives you a little idea of how the treatment is delivered. So uh, this will be the pre-screening, this will be the, the, the PSMA PET scan that we use at the beginning. We used to use gallium PSMA, we moved to a fluorinated PSMA molecule now. And this is a typical patient that we're treating in the study. You know, chemotherapy, enzalutamide, abiraterone, and enzalutamide, feeling terrible. Once we deliver the treatment, we do serial spect imaging. Um, so we can quantify where the radiation is going and then we use a uh, voxelated uh, algorithm so that we can actually build doses so the so the nuclear medicine physician will see this picture on the right and then you can just draw regions around your kidneys and your bone and actually get an accurate assessment of the dose that we're given which is I'll, I'll come on to the dose industry results later but they're very relevant in, in terms of moving these treatments earlier in the treatment paradigm and this is the response in this patient you know, assessed by, PS, by uh, PSMA, and you can see dramatic reduction. Um, uh, we, some people say, well, maybe you're just measuring the PSMA of a disease, but we do see soft tissue shrinkage here, and the PSA fought, fell from 1,000 to 7, and this, this chance pain just completely resolved. And, uh, you know, I can't remember exactly how many courses we gave this guy. I think we gave him two courses. So, um, to look at the dosimetry, so the key organs that we're concerned about are kidneys, saliva, root glands, and you see these on the right are our tolerance doses from external beam. And you see we're well within those tolerances if we give four cycles of this treatment in an average patient. I say that because the bar distribution is different between patients. And really, what we want to be able to do is to customize that. You know, if we've got somebody that we've given a treatment to, and we've done dose and treatment, we can see, well, their, their uptake of normal tissues is very low, then we might give them higher activity. Or, you know, so we can individualize this treatment. And as radiation oncologists, I'm used to giving a dose I'm used to giving a dose to a tumour rather than just having an activity and relying on its bar distribution. But I don't think we're that far away from individualised dosimetry. So this picture, this, I mean, this, this picture, this, there's a story behind this picture. You see these eight cases here. These are the PET scans and the PSAs at the bottom. These are our, what we call exceptional respondents. This is actually eight patients from the cohort uh, of 50 patients we did. But we had six of, six of these cases from the original cohorts. Anyway, we submitted this patient paper to Lancet Oncology and uh, my, my colleague put this picture in. They made us take this out. They said, we don't, we don't, we don't do individual cases in, in these things, you know, because we're not interested in anecdotes. You know, and you, but you could argue that you know, to have six expect, exceptional responders out of 30, it's not an anecdote, really. It's something which is not uncommon. Anyway, they made us take this out. So my colleague sent, this, sent the pictures to the JNM, and this one, this S and M image of the year, because it's just so dramatic. The, the responses are so dramatic. Anyway, their loss, I think. But anyway, that's the way the editorials work. So, um, so on the basis of this study, we've, we've got well, we've obviously got other studies that we've planned. The, the lowest rung was to try and see if we could, you know, take the very end of line treatment. And there's lots of cabazitaxel, which is used second line in Australia. So we have a randomised study, and you can see. We've adjusted our criteria with our learning curve as to how we select patients for the study. But this is recruiting very well um, with a target of 200 patients and we're, we're well ahead of activity. We've got 11 sites recruiting to the study in Australia. And uh, we should have finished recruitment before the end of the year and have some readout from that study. But it looks very encouraging what I've seen so far. So that's, uh, and there, you know, there, there are other studies going on. Uh, I think so there's, there's quite a few studies opening up here in, in uh, the States now, I think. The vision study is opened up, and, and we've been lucky. I mean, we, we're lucky in Australia. But we want to give radionuclides and new agents. It's very easy in Australia. I mean, we, I wrote this protocol one Christmas. We sort of finalised it by January, February, and by August we were giving this stuff. And you know, I mean, this is a this is a five year project in most countries, but Australia is really easy. So you know, I'm not saying that that, that, that we're super amazing at what we've done, but we've been very. We, it's very easy to work in that environment to develop these these uh, these treatments. A colleague in the UK says, come back and do it here. And I was talking about it a while ago, moving back to the UK, and he says, well, 
you can forget doing this research here unless you want to wait 10 years because you'll never get it through the regulations. So, so we're lucky in Australia. Anyway, so those are the, those are the betas. And I'm, I'm just going to, so half an hour, do you want to get onto the cases? I'll dash through some of the other isotopes. So alpha particles. Some of you may, I don't know if you're familiar with this PSMA work, you've been seeing it. So you've seen this, the work on alphas. So alphas are a different kettle of fish, and there's, a lot, there's quite a lot of interest in alphas at the moment. The main thing is that, if you look on the last column, it's this LA, LET, they're very damaging. They're very damaging. And uh, uh, I often describe them as, uh, they're like a little hooligan. You know, it's like uh, some burly man coming into your kitchen with a baseball cap. They, wherever an alpha goes, if, it, if an alpha passes next to a cell, and a track of one of these helium particles goes through your cell, the cell will die. There's no doubt about it. You know, with, 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 high LED, with low LET, you need a few hits, they need to hit the right place in the DNA, and actually normal tissues will tolerate betas very well. You know, yeah. you know, you know fractionate treatment, a bit slowly, the normal tissues can recover. They cannot recover from an alpha. Once an alpha's gone through it, it's dead. So um, the only thing to their advantage in, in terms of their relative toxicity is their range. It's very much, if you look at this, is this is, this is a slide I took from a rhenium talk actually, and you see if you look at the alpha at the bottom, it's because the range is just a few cell diameters, they're more targeted, which may be an advantage of reducing marrow, you know, dose to the bone marrow, but still they're very damaging. And uh, but they can overcome resistance to beta particle therapy. I mean the, the, the prototype actually came again from neuroendocrine tumors. This is the first use of an alpha particle with a somatostatin analogue. In a patient being treated for neuroendocrine tumor, this, these liver deposits were resistant to, you know, uh, you know, beta label data top. But you give bismuth two one three alpha particle, and you can, you know, this disease responded. So this has been looked at. This has been looked at a lot in um, with PSMA. This is somebody that um, that had lots of bone disease, and it was felt that if they gave a beta, actually, it's not our experience. I'll show you. So it's not our experience that having heavy marine film filtration necessarily leads. A lot of blood toxicity with lutetian therapy, but the Germans um, they tend to exclude patients that have got lots of this lots of bony disease, and they've started using um, alphas in these patients. And there doesn't seem to be as much hematological toxicity. This is the case here of somebody resistant to lutetian PSMA therapy who does respond to an alpha emitter. But look at the salivary glands. Can you see the salivary glands on the left? And what you see is that they're still functioning. You know, as I said, and you put an alpha particle through them, they stop functioning. So, um, you know, severe, you know, these patients, even though responding to treatment, in these studies, a huge number of patients are dropping out because one or two doses of alpha, and then just all the salivary tissue is gone. And actually, if you look at the, if you look at these, uh, if you look at the response rates, maybe these, I mean, they're a very heavily pre-treated group of patients, but they're not so much better than the data I showed you for our, uh, beta particles. This is how we're trying to deal with the salivary issue. You can inject botulinum toxin into your glossy glands and you can reduce PSMA uptake. But you know, botulinum takes, you've got three months of dry mouth anyway because of the botulinum toxin. But the main concern is kidneys, really. You know, imagine the kidney can very lie just, it's, you know, just one layer of cells which is crucial to filtration in your kidneys. And we know from preclinical work that if you, if you put alphas through kidneys, all the tumours disappear. The results were great, but if the, if the investigators savvy enough to keep the mouse alive for six months, then you know uh, the kidneys fail. And actually, I've also seen data get respiratory failure because you know pump through the all these type one pneumocytes and you just cook them with your alpha emitters. So I think alpha emitters are exciting, but I think they they will probably remain an end stage treatment until we have some better targeting. But that's a personal view. We haven't got that long term data yet in humans. Now I can talk, I'm going to talk, I'll mention just a little bit about OJs. I mean, maybe, maybe that's a bit, a bit, maybe that's a bit too radiation heavy, but, but uh, OJs are interesting because they, um, they're high LET, you look at the column on the right, so they're damaging, very damaging, but their range is in nanometers, so they only really take out cells if they're glued onto the DNA, really. But it does look at the PSMA, it gets very close to nuclear DNA. If you look at the picture on the right, this, this is, um, this is the, these are the mitotic spindle poles here, and, and for some reason PSMA uh, is expressed there. And it may be a driver of aneuploidy, but it does mean that the PSA comes into very close contact with DNA. And it's possible that you will see an effect from those OGA emitters in this group. And there's preclinical data, this is, 
There's another study that uh, I saw recently using another isotope. There's certainly a preclinical mo molecules that show efficacy. So you get the damage of an alpha without this, potentially, possibly without the damage that you see in kidneys and salivary tissues. Might be the optimal treatment for just taking out single tumor cells. And the synergy between the synergy between uh, beta emitters and PARP inhibitors. You know, these PARP inhibitors, as you know, stop repair of single strand breaks. If you're trying to accumulate single strand breaks with a low LET agent, and you can stop them from being repaired, it, will make, it should theoretically make the treatment more efficient. And this has been proven with neuroendocrine tumors and work which is unpublished from the Peter Matt shows that this happens with PSMA as well. So we have a study looking at a combination of Lutetium and PSMA, which is also in development. So very exciting data, and uh, but we've only really tested we've only really tested this so far in very end stage patients. Um, but you know, um, I haven't shown you the dosimetry data here because I want to, I want to I, I think you might find it a bit dry. But um, I, well, I haven't shown you in a lot of detail. But what the main point of that data is to say, well, look. If we know that we, we're, we're going to give radiation with intolerance of, all, of these normal tissues, it gives, you, it gives you agency to bring them earlier in the course of treatment because you know, with, with lots of chemotherapy agents, you don't really know what the long-term effects will be. But we do know, because we know the effects are due to radiation dose, we know with intolerance of the kidneys, if we're giving it to men with early disease, I mean, we radiate kidneys to 10, 12, 15 grain all the time with external beam. And these patients live 15, 20 years. We know that we're not going to put them into renal failure. So this, the radiation dose symmetry is really key as to us saying, well, these treatments are safe to bring them earlier in the armamentarium that we're, we're treating prostate cancer. So what about localized disease? I mean, you know, it's quite feasible. When we, we've done some dose, and actually not that many men in our studies had intact prostates when we gave them, but we can look at PSMA dose symmetry within the prostate. And, you know, you can give 30, 40 gray with each fraction of this treatment to the prostate. So you could see a role whereby, you know, you could give it before, you take some of the prostate out, you know, you can give them mere adjuvant radiation and then operate on them. You know, you could give it as an adjunct to external beam, you can give like, you know, standard dose radiation and you can give it a little boost with PSMA. So I think this is reasonable. Maybe with a beta or with an OJ, you could use it in that setting. Local regional disease, we're radiating the prostate, but we can only give 50 gray to the nodes because we run out of space with bowel. Well, maybe we could boost those by using PSMA. So these are the very early approaches where you could see a role for this. Castration sensitive disease. We know the synergy between ADT and uh, radiation. You know, docetaxel is a radiosensitizer. We could use that alongside lutetium as a sequential treatment or be really bold. So there's lots of work being done designing these studies. I know there's a there's a uh, castrate um, there's a castrate um, uh, resistant versus docetaxel study, which I think is going to be opening here soon. So I think there's plenty of scope for um, bringing these agents earlier and and exploiting these synergies. I mean, alongside everything else, I mean. How much dose should we be giving? I mean, we're giving four cycles. Maybe that's, we don't know. Maybe six is right. Maybe two is right. We give them six week intervals now. Maybe that's wrong. Maybe we should give them four weeks. I mean, there's no standard here. So all these subtleties. Then, you know, I said PSMA 617 is a first generation molecule. New molecules are coming along, which are more targeted, have less light. I mean, there's all this. This is early days. So, um, so I'll just sum, I'll summarize this, and then what I wanted to do, if, if you're interested, is just show you a few cases, just showing how we select patients for treatment, because I think that's that's quite interesting. So I mean, so the beta particles, they 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 seem to have you know, a lot of activity, and they're well tolerated. You know, um, we could be using these earlier. The dosimetry supports that, and there are good arguments for also arguments for using them earlier, because you know this discordance, this FDG PSMA discordance. We don't really expect that in earlier stage disease. It's more an end stage phenomenon, you know, tumors de differentiate and they lose PSMA expression. I suspect we wouldn't see that we've been the treatments earlier. And uh, of course, there are the new agents to think about. So, um, so that's what I was going to that was, that was the first part of the talk, and I think I'm running out of time, so I'll move quickly onto the cases. But this is the team, and we, we I mean, these. There are other issues about introducing these agents into the clinic, as you probably all know about Zevalin, and there's a nuclear medicine-based treatment, but really you need a multidisciplinary approach to this. And we work very closely. I'm a, I'm a radiation oncologist. We work with nuclear medicine. We work with medical oncology and the surgeons. And I think probably that's the way to introduce these treatments into the clinic. 
They've still got lots of efficacy, but there's still lots to learn to optimize them. So anyway, this is the team. This is the Euro-Oncology team, and this is the nuclear medicine team. And to be, to be fair, I think the nuclear medicine team have really been really key, and the lessons from treatment of neuroendocrine tumors has been really key to optimal development of these agents. Anyway, I'll show you a few pictures now if I have time, if I can work out how to do this. So anyway, I'll show you a few cases here. And, um, I'll show you a few, just to, uh, just to illustrate a few things. So this is, this is, this is, so the patient will come through the door, and this, and you know, we'll look at them, they're fit enough, and you know, they, other criteria that we used to select the patients for these studies. And on the left, you can see the PSMA PET scan, you can see multiple sites of disease, and the right is the FDG PET scan. Now, I was discussing with the, and the medical round yesterday about whether you actually need this FDG PET scan. Is it, is it essential to developing these agents? Well, maybe not essential, depending on where you apply the treatment. But I think if you're applying it end line, and you're going to see you know, uh, significant amounts of discordant disease, I think it's probably useful. You know, particularly if you're doing a randomized study and you, you're comparing two different treatments, and you might have 50% you know, discordant in one, in, in one arm and 10% in the other arm. And we know, I mean, I didn't show you the data, but we know from the discordant disease that those patients do really badly. The patients that had discordant disease were excluded from our study were all dead within two or three months. So I think probably end-stage disease, you should do both of them. I would call this optimal imaging. So anyway, so this, 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 this is how we, we look at this patient and say this is good. Um, you see that the, the PSMA is very black, so we've got high expression of PSMA, no discordance. So what we, we would do is we treat them, and following each treatment, actually we're doing dosimetry in the studies, so we did multiple specs, but we do at least, even in, in future studies where we're not doing dosimetry, we routinely do a spec scan. I use that as a surrogate for where the radiation is going and also for response. Because you don't want to say expensive PSMA PET scans. Actually, they're relatively cheap in Australia, but, but we would use suspect because we, we, we need this information anyway to show that the radiation is going where it's going. And you can actually see, so if you look in these suspect images here, you can see the radiation is still being carried, still being carried to the tumor. You actually look at the boards on the bottom, you can see the tumor shrinking. And so you just need to remember that this isn't telling you where your disease is, this is telling you where your radiation is going. So we'd look at this, and actually, you'd find patients after two or three cycles. You do these scans, and you see like virtually no uptake of PSMA PET scan. In other words, you've eradicated most of the disease, and those patients would stop, you know, and their PSA is you know, it's fallen from a thousand to five or something. And then we'd just watch them. There's not like chemotherapy where if you're resistant to, you become resistant to it, it often doesn't work. When they recurred later on, I'll show you a case, then we re-challenge them, and uh, they'll respond again. So, so this is one of the one of the exceptional one of our exceptional responders here. You see the extent of the disease on the left, PSMA PET scan on the right. There's no discordant disease, and actually we treated him, and you see, um, I think had two cycles of therapy. The disease all went. There's nothing left on the spec. So if you inject it, it's not going to go anywhere. It's just going to it's not going to find a target. It'll just come out through the kidneys and go to the salivary tissues. And we've shown that in our dosimetry, there is a sink effect. The more tumor you have the less uptake you see in saliva tissue and kidneys. I haven't shown you that data. It does show you that you know, we can customize you know, we can customize treatment on the basis of this. But you see here, so three months, six months, and by nine months later, the disease is just starting to creep back. By 10 months, you know, uh, at this stage, we considered retreatment. And here you can see is the post-therapy spect images from another two cycles of therapy to which you responded. You can see how it's starting to, you can see, remember I told you, marrow appears to be a sanctuary site. Can you start to see the black increasing and become diffuse throughout the marrow? In the end, that was again, this was diffuse marrow infiltration. This does seem to be a sanctuary site. We need a way to we need a way to target the marrow. But anyway, this patient went on, had another response. Actually, um, they became, you know, their platelets dropped in this after about four cycles, six cycles, they dropped to about 50, which was stable. Um, but then there was progression with this, you know, marrow filling up with tumor. But it just illustrates the principle that you can go back. You know, and some people are going back after 12 months, some patients after three months, you know. You don't necessarily need to go in there and just, because it becomes a law of diminishing returns. If you've not got any PSMA avid disease and you're giving an isotope, you're just wasting treatment. It's not going anywhere. It's much bigger bang for your buck to see something on your imaging. So this is, uh, this is an interesting case. This is, if you look at the PSMA image on the left and the FDG image on the right, I want you to draw your attention to that disease within the chest. 
can see it's very hot in FDG PET, but not so hot in PSMA PET. And when we did the dosimetry in this guy, actually a lot of the disease responded on other sites. So I'll show you the liver pictures on the next scan. That responded. But this chest disease, this single sided disease that didn't express very much PSMA, well, we just boosted it. I gave the radiation oncologist, we just gave, we gave 20 and 5 to that area. So having what I call sort of like oligometastatic disease within the course of therapy that's not responded to PSMA, you can still treat it with external beam. It doesn't mean you need to stop the lutetia treating these other sites. I've got a, I'll show you a case later on where we did the same thing. So if you look at this guy, if you look at the liver, it was interesting. And this guy, a very rapidly progressive disease, he actually didn't do very well. If you look at the boards on the bottom, what you can see is the, the lutetium goes to the active site of the disease and the liver on the, and then we'd eradicate that disease. With the next treatment, we go to the next bit of liver where the disease had popped up. And then the next, the next cycle went to another bit of the liver disease. And actually, you see the, the disease in the chest responded because we treated that with external beam. But this guy's disease was crazy. You know, actually, um, it was growing so quickly between cycles. It's one of these things that makes you think, well, maybe we shouldn't be given treatment every six weeks. We should be given every two or three weeks because they obviously the pace of the disease was so rapid. Anyway, he didn't do very well, but it just illustrates that you know um, you don't necessarily if you've just got a single area that's progressing, it doesn't mean well, we always stop this treatment. You can carry on giving the tissue and you can just spot weld. So, um, so this is this is somebody that we would exclude from the study. Can anybody tell me why we're not going to treat this guy? And back row, are these all the residents? So if you look at the PSMA scan on the left, look at, look at, the, look at the, uh, the intensity of uptake in the salivary tissues and look at the bone, it's much less. So this guy, we, we deliver the treatments, there's not very much PSMA expression, so the dose we deliver to the tumor is less. Actually, we looked at this with SPECT imaging and you can correlate this SUV on SPECT with dose. Uh, and we also know that if you give a dose less than 10 gray, and you can assess that with dosimetry, virtually none of the patients responded. But dose above 10 gray, we saw responses. So we'd exclude this patients and direct them towards other therapies because we're not going to get an adequate dose into the tumor. Um, so this is this is uh, this guy flew down to us from Queensland, and as you see, he had lots of disease, and particularly lots of disease in the skull bones. You see all this stuff up here. Anyway, we treated him. Uh, we gave him a dose of mutation. He went back to Queensland and uh, he phoned me up just before Christmas to say, "Well, I I do a video follow up with him. I think I treated him." And he's like. Oh, I've got double vision. And it's like, oh. He said, I went to my ophthalmologist and told me I had some transient nerve cords. And he said, don't worry about it, I'm going away. And I looked at this and I said, that is a skull base disease here. So it was either flare or progression in that area. And I've got a radiation oncologist, I know up in Queensland. And I said, look, I'm just put a skull base field. And he had the skull base field. Actually, his ophthalmopleader all improved and he came back down again. And uh, we gave him a few more cycles of therapy. And these are his post-therapy spec scans. Now, actually, the point here is that they don't look very different, these scans. But actually, this guy's patient, his pain went, his PSA was falling. So you can't just look at the imaging to decide who to treat. Actually, our protocols we've written in. The decision to stop treatment is not just based upon PSA or imaging response, because some of these patients still benefit. And sometimes between cycles, the PSA will go up and then it will come down again. If you look at standard stopping rules for chemotherapy, the PSA goes, we just stop. It's not that simple with this treatment. Sometimes you give the treatment, it's delayed, and you see this sort of, you see the PSA slowly falling with time. This guy, you just looked at the post-treatment spec images, and you know, you'd say, we should stop. Well, we gave this guy, we kept this guy alive for nearly a year, with virtually no changes in this post-treatment imaging. And um, so you just, the, the lesson is you have to look at the whole picture, clinical, biochemical and imaging. Did he present with a lot of pain? He had to generalize what he had. He was on opiates. So it wasn't localized to this. No, we didn't really have to pain like that. Did it help him at all? What's that? Did, did your treatment help his pain? Oh, yes, he came back. After his first treatment, all his pain went. Why? Yeah, it was amazing. And he was so happy. And, you know, I mean, and this ophthalmophobia, he was like, he was so happy because he was pain free. He was like, oh, he wasn't too worried about it. I said, look. I think double vision is a major thing anyway, and it, it all went. So, I mean, it could have been flare, I and mean, we think you, you may see flare. You know, when you give radiation, you can sometimes see uh, increased pain when you radiate. And we don't know whether it was flare, whether it's oligo progression, or when you irradiated him, there's a low morbidity treatment, he got better. So, anyway, so um, and that's all the cases I had. So, um, it just, you know, given the treatment, it's, it's, it's very different to giving a systemic chemotherapy. And there's, a, there's a few subtleties in the imaging. You really need a new med. 
somebody that understands symptoms and so forth and other to optimally apply these treatments. So any questions?